All right then, uh, open up your Bibles to Genesis thirteen thirteen. 13. Great start, huh? The number 13 is known to be an infamous number in your Bible, and even amongst the unbelieving world, 13 is a popular number that's known for bad omens and for bad things that happen. But there's an element of truth behind that, because in the Bible, the number 13, as I've taught you before, it stands for rebellion. But uh, I'll expound a little bit further on that one later on, but I won't expound too much since that was covered in our previous Genesis studies. Let's look at Genesis chapter 13, and we'll look at verse 13. The Word of God reads, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So, in other words, what the text is saying is that the people in the city of Sodom, they were wicked and they were sinners in the presence of the Lord exceedingly. So they were excessive in their sin. They were a huge problem to God in the city of Sodom. What was going on in the city of Sodom that made God detest it in their wickedness? Uh, now we know that in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that the uh, sin of homosexuality was definitely rampant. But it was beyond that, you have to understand. There was a lot of sexual... The main point with Sodom was sexual perversion. They were experimenting with so much stuff. You talk about LGBTQ+, it was going on long time ago in the B.C.s, not today. They were experimenting with all sorts of stuff that you recall at Genesis chapter 6... They were mingling with uh, animals and possibly even just uh, inanimate objects as the sons of God were intermingling with everything and humans were intermingling with everybody. So Sodom and Gomorrah was following the same pattern. What you got to understand is they were following the same sins, following the same actions that was done at Genesis chapter 6. So in other words, they were trying to revive something again. Remember, God drowned out the world at, with Noah's flood at Genesis chapter 6 because there was something going on. The sons of God were intermingling with the daughters of men. So aliens were intermingling with humans, so to speak. And as there was that intermingling going on with mankind... There was all sorts of mutations and the mutants and all sorts of demonic offspring that was born. I taught you that, Genesis 6. Sodom and Gomorrah, they were trying to repeat that example. Now, where would they get that idea from, right? Well, we see a first possible action that could have occurred with Ham and Noah. You might recall that one. And then if you look at Ham's offspring, I told you last time, it's interesting that traces and lineages of the sons of God continuing in the Bible, you'll notice <clears throat> the mentions of it through Ham's offspring. So it may have been possible. How did the children get that knowledge unless they get it from their... They didn't have TV back then, guys. You know where children get the language from, their behavior from? You, right? So you have to watch your attitude, especially when you have kids. They follow your example. So there was no way that they could have just got it from thin air. They got it from previous knowledge prior. And it would make sense that uh, when I showed you some interesting verses that there was some kind of possible connection what Ham did. Looking at this passage with Sodom and Gomorrah, if Sodom was carrying on what they were doing at Genesis chapter 6, let's look at the passage that will prove it. Jude. Jude. We're going to look at the book of Jude. Now, this passage has been quoted where Sodom and Gomorrah have committed the grotesque sin of homosexuality, but it's deeper than that. It's more than that. That's just a simple layer of it. Look at Jude. <clears throat> and then we'll look at verse 6. Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. Well, that's very plain, isn't it? That's very plain that the sons of God, those angels, they left their abode and came down on the earth 
Why? Because Genesis 6, I pointed out, they were intermingling with the humans. Keep reading. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So the Lord, he reserved them for judgment. That's why he sent the judgment of Noah's flood. Many people died and then now they're in hell. They're reserved for the great day of judgment at the end. Okay, this is Genesis 6, right? Jude 1, 6. We can see that. The only time that we ever see this recorded in the Bible that happened is Genesis 6. There's no other event, no other passage you can point out. If Jude 6 is pointing that out, and this is Genesis 6, look at the wording. Every word in your Bible is important. All right? Look how the word proceeds at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you see that? Okay, what does that mean? Sodom and Gomorrah was following verse 6, what those sons of God were doing at Genesis 6. So then they were following their pattern and the cities about them in like manner. So the cities around Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember I pointed out there were five infamous cities surrounding Sodom. I pointed that out to you, Adma, Zeboam, etc., uh, yeah, exactly. I pointed out Berkeley, San Francisco, San Jose, Santa Clara. I did that one last time, you know. I mean, you can't blame Lot for going over there, right? Uh, Fisherman's Wharf is very pretty. It's still one of the top ten places in the world to tour, believe it or not, San Francisco. Uh, if you keep reading on, the cities about them in what? Like manner they were following their behavior of Jude 6 giving themselves over to fornication. See, it's sexual, but it's not just sexual. And going after what? Strange flesh. That's evidence right here that it was beyond just human flesh. It's this strange flesh. Why? Because if you recall what I expounded in previous Genesis studies, when the Bible says flesh, flesh, and flesh, it's referring to mankind. For example, the life of the flesh is in the blood. In that passage, it's pointing out mankind. The Bible says, all flesh is as grass. Another verse. That's talking about mankind, right? Everyone's being weak and human. So flesh is referring to mankind. But this verse does not say strain. Uh, this verse does not say flesh. This verse says strange flesh. You notice that? So what does strange flesh mean? Strange means other Strange means other. So an, it also means another. It also means another. So what's another type of flesh or other type of flesh? It's animal. See that? It's animal. 1 Corinthians 15 will point that out to you. It'll say there's another kind of flesh. And they'll point out birds and all the list of the animals. So see, Sodom and Gomorrah, there's no doubt, they were doing sexual perversion. It was really, really dark stuff. What you're seeing today is kitty stuff. You know that? Back at Genesis 6, it was a lot more dark. It was a lot more dark. So Sodom and Gomorrah were following that example. That's why the Bible says the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So God saw that and it was very dark. You got to realize that God sees everything, right? Do, do we know that? Okay, it, imagine God has to see that. Not just one action, but but multiple actions, hundreds of those actions, every second. See, in the eyes of holy God, we might tolerate, we might get away with it, but not when you're seeing that every single second and day. So holy God is different from us. That's the reason why he cannot stand that. That's the reason why he sent down judgment. Now, we see right here at the end of verse 7, it says, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So we know the story, God burned it to the ground, but we'll get to that later. Point is, they were following the example of Genesis 6 all over again, which is why this is interesting. Then, what's the offspring from Sodom and Gomorrah? Right? Would giants come out again? The super, uh, would the mutants come out again? The X-Men, the supermen, those little gods. Well, yeah, because look at Genesis 14, the next chapter, all right? Genesis 14. And I want you to go to Deuteronomy 2. This is interesting. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 2, and we're going to go to G Genesis chapter 14. 
Now, if you recall that Genesis chapter 6, these beings, the offspring that came out, they were known to be Nephilim. For some of you who didn't know that, Nephilim. So for some of you who've heard that word before, it's been a famous word referring to the giants or to the superhumans that became the offspring from these aliens intermingling with mankind. So Nephilim has been a famous word, but this is the word that has not been known. Sodom and Gomorrah, they were following their example, but they were not called Nephilim, the offspring. All right? They're, they were given a different name. Look at Genesis 14. Look at this. Look at verse 2. That these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Now remember, those are the five that are cities that the Lord always had a problem with. I already told you that. So they're all in it together. Now look at the next part right here. It says at verse 5, In the fourteenth year came Chedoleomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the who? Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Carnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Yemims in Shava Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, until El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazizon Tamar. So notice that these people are mentioned in the Vale of Siddim. They're also mentioned as Rephaims, and you'll see Horites, you'll see Mount Seir. Now, for some of you who don't know, Mount Seir is related to uh, Esau's descendants later on in life. We see Amalekites and Amorites. Now, you see these words, Chedoleomar, to build up the context, he went up against these people, right? That's what we got from this text, right? When he go, why would he go against these people? You have to ask yourself, why? Because of verse, look at verse 1 and 2. See that? 1, Chedoleomar is mentioned, right? But verse 2 says, Chedoleomar made war with who? Sodom and the other four cities. Okay, point is then Chedoleomar at verse 5, why he was fighting against these people is because these people then were the ones he was warring at verse 2. Who's verse 2? Sodom and the five cities. Okay, so what did we get so far? What, what we got so far is, uh, man, I don't think I'm going to spell this name right. Chedoleomer. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. Cheddar cheese, yeah, that would be easier. C-H-E-D-O-R-L-A-O-M-E-R. -E All right, Chedoleomer. So Chedoleomer, I'm going to draw this out so that you can, it can make a little bit more sense. Chedoleomer, he was versing Sodom. Is that correct so far? All right, so they're clashing against each other, Sodom versus Chedoleomer. Chedo if we establish that verse 1 and 2, why do the next verses, it says Chedoleomer was going against Rephaim and then some other names right here in Mount Seir, Amalekites, Amorites. Why would he attack them? Because unless they're aligned with each other. See that? So unless they're aligned with each other, that's the reason why he's attacking them. Now look at Deuteronomy 2, all right? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 2. Now, look at the words here. Remember the words. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 20. That also was accounted a land of giants. So there's a particular terrain that's a land of giants. So this is not Genesis 6. This is during the time of Moses. Giants dwelt there in, in old time. And the Ammonites called them Zamzumins. A people grade many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. Huh. One clue number one, verse 21, it says the Lord destroyed them. But then there were people who succeeded them. They were successors. When did the Lord destroy these giants? 
We obviously think Genesis 6, but it could be another event too. Because look at the location where the Lord destroyed them. Verse 22, as he did to the children of who? Esau, which dwelt in what? Seir, when he destroyed the who? Horems from before him. Wait a minute. Go back to verse 5 and 6. Look at the wordings, how they're very close. Verse 6, and the Horites, see the closeness? In their mount, what? Seir. Okay, go back to Deuteronomy 2. Let me keep reading. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. All right, that's verse 22. Verse 23, and the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, reading onward, even unto Azza, the Kaphtorims, which came forth out of Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. And then if you, uh, you read onward over here at verse 24, Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given the... Uh, into thine hand, Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon and his land, begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. Why, go back to verse 7, you'll notice Amorites mentioned, right? At Genesis 14, 7, excuse me. Genesis 14, 7, you'll see right there, Amorite mentioned, right? Okay, so what's going on over here? Well, if you go back, uh, well, we're not going to go back and forth, but that should be enough. If you see right here, then these giants at Deuteronomy 2, right? They're, un they're undoubtedly in that same terrain back at Genesis 14. That's what it's talking about. We established that, right? So then this Rephaim group, they were at the terrain where we see Mount Seir, and it says the Lord destroyed them before. He destroyed who? The giants before. Right? He said he, just, he destroyed the giants before them in this location. But the Bible says the Rephaim were there. For some of you who don't know, okay, the modern Bible versions are harder to understand than the English King James Bible. Didn't you know that? You, you, it, sometimes it does. And the evidence is this passage. The Bible never says Nephilim or the Hebrew transliterated words. The uh, King James Bible translates into English. It calls it giants. If you look at Genesis 6, the modern Bible versions will say Nephilim. They won't say giants. And then people who read that the first time will go, what is Nephilim? You know? And then the King James Bible says giant, and then the people will go, well, I know what that means. Well, they change Genesis 6 from giant to Nephilim. But that's a Hebrew rendition of it. It means giant. Well, if you look at Deuteronomy 2, they did the same, uh, the modern versions did the same thing. If you look at Deuteronomy 2, it says accounted for a land of giants, right? Modern Bible version says Rephaim. That's another Hebrew rendition. So see that? These uh, Sodomites, when they were intermingling, and then they produced offsprings of giants, we see the Hebrew wording what they were called, Rephaim. So Genesis 13, they were known as Rephaim. In Genesis 6, they were known as Nephilim in the Hebrew renditions. In English, it's easier. It's giants. All right, simple as that. But that's pretty interesting. So they were, there was no doubt Sodom was repeating a pattern of Genesis 6. But during that time, it wasn't worded as Nephilim. During that time, it was worded as Rephaim. They were doing something else again. All right, go back to Genesis 13. That's why the Lord wiped them out. You see that? You know what causes God's hand of destruction? It's when these demonic offsprings start to literally do something with mankind. Some people might wonder, why doesn't God send judgment yet? Why is he so merciful many times when people still cuss out his name and sin is going on and God doesn't do anything? There must be no God then. No, that's God's mercy and grace. He's done that for 6,000 years. He did not send a Noah's flood and he already put his word he won't send a watery flood. Because he put his oath that he won't send a watery flood, he's going to have to send a different kind of judgment. So... That's an example of God's mercy where he put up with mankind. But you notice throughout your Bible when he did a worldwide cataclysmic event where he would uh, destroy mankind. 
It's when they interact with demonic beings. Eve changed all of human history when she interacted with the demonic being. Genesis 6, mankind was wiped out when they interacted with the demonic being. Tower of Babel, they were trying to interact with demonic beings, which caused the Lord to split them. I taught you that one last time, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, it makes sense. Why did God wipe them all out? Because interaction with demonic beings. Why in Exodus, Moses, Joshua, and those soldiers had to wipe out the Canaanites and those people? They were interacting with demonic beings. We saw that in Deuteronomy 2. So why didn't God send judgment now yet? We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Look, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not fiction anymore. Scientists are even saying that now. NASA has been saying that. There are famous uh, astrophysicists and, uh, and people who studied the universe out there. They've been saying that there is possibly life out there and we want to interact with them. World Economic Forum said that by 2030, we'll be in contact with uh, life out there or we're going to make attempts to actually see something or communicate. That's their ultimate goal. That's why they all want to go up there. Why? Learn something from these guys. Why? Because Eve learned something from an uh, intergalactic, out-of-the-world being. Right? And it's called Tree of Knowledge. And the devil told Eve, you know, that uh, once you, when they were communicating, ye shall be as gods knowing. See, we, we want to learn alien technology. That's what Hollywood has been programming people now. Programming people that way when they come down, you don't get shocked. You get so conditioned to it, then you get used to it that when they come down, it'll be a surprise, but not that bad of a surprise. You'll kind of tolerate and you'll kind of be open-minded and say, you know, this is pretty cool. That's why they do those alien movies, predator movies, and uh, superhero movies. All right, it's coming. And the Bible already told you that's what's going to happen. At the tribulation, that's when Jesus is going to come down and cast judgment on the earth. In the future tribulation, not now. Why will God do that, the future tribulation? Easy. They interacted with demonic offspring. That's why. By that, it will happen, guys. So, you know why I'm a saved believer? Why I'm a Bible believer? I'm seeing so much of this book that was predicted and talked about so many years and eons ago that's coming to pass. And from the past two years, if you haven't been seeing that, then you've been blinded. Yeah. You know how you blind the people? It's very simple. All you have to do is give some kind of knowledge that's legitimate and sounds rational, and it's an excuse that can cover up. Anyone, have you ever met a good liar? And it sounds rational, uh, rational it sounds reasonable. Anyone can make up a good lie, especially if you have... PhDs, if, even if you back up with empirical evidence, and if you have lots of people backing you up, you can create a very, very good, believable story and lie. So even if you told them all this about the Bible, they'll, have always, alternate, uh, they'll always have other explanations for it, right. alternative explanations for it. I've learned that. It'll never change. Uh, it's, easy, it's interesting when I studied uh, for my doctorate program, and I was studying about the science bias in research, it's uh, phenomenal. I'm just very surprised. And when they were doing analytical studies and actual research studies, I pulled up articles, and I've told some of you of this before, uh, one time in video, I gave you the sources and the quotes where they said that you cannot separate political personal bias even in empirical research. Because when they weighed the odds, they can see how much it was leaning toward bias. You'll always be biased no matter how empirical it is. Right, right, right. Why? Because anyone can pull up something empirical or rationale. Anyone can do that. As long as it backs up your story, right? right. All right, let's look at Genesis 13. Genesis 13. That's what uh, we learn in life. Genesis chapter 13. And then we'll read verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him. Now, isn't that eye-opening right there? As soon as Lot was gone, the Lord was able to speak and talk to Abram. So he was called Abram that time, not Abraham yet. 
the Lord can only communicate with Abram once Lot was gone. Lot had to depart. Lot had to get out. Once Lot was out of the way, the Lord can communicate and speak to him. That shows that Lot, there was something there that uh, the Lord didn't like, obviously. Remember his original command to Abram that he's supposed to go out by faith himself, but he took his family with him, some of his family members with him. But then once Lot got out of the way, the Lord was able to now speak more freely with him. In fact, what he mentioned right here, I mean, why would the Holy Spirit word that after that Lot was separated from him, right? It shows there's some meaning here to God when he was speaking to Abram. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. All right, if you look at verse 14, God was speaking to Abram once Lot was gone that uh, lift up your eyes, all right? So that means like, hey, look around you, look around you. Uh, and then from the place where you are, he says, look at north, south, east, west. Now remember where Abram was at, if you recall, is at verse 3. He was... Uh, at Bethel that time, somewhere between Bethel and Ai, right? So remember that in his terrain, he was somewhere between Bethel. Is the word cut out? No, right? Okay, thank you. And Ai. Now, during that time, it was Hai, but later on, it was called Ai, which you know is a small city that Joshua had to conquer. But aside from that, between Bethel and Ai, he was looking north, south, east, and west. Now, look what God says. Why do I say all that? Because this is very important. Because there's too many politics, too many arguments about whose land belongs to who. But God makes it very clear. If we know this is where Abram's at, and God said, look around you, north, south, east, and west, then what did God say at verse 15? For what? All, it didn't say all the land. It didn't say some. It didn't say, like, we're, we're going to part the land. The Bible says all the land which thou seest. See that? Everything that Abram sees, to thee will I give it. God says he's going to give it to Abram. And to what? Thy seed. That's Abram's lineage, his children. How long? Forever. That means it's permanent. It's forever. God says that it cannot be taken away. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So God says that he's going to increase his children. A lineage is going to increase. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So that's a metaphorical expression right there that God's saying, if you can count every dust particle that's on the earth, then you'll be able to count all of uh, Abraham's children. So that's how numerous it will be. Numerous Abraham's children will be. The Jews, they say, our father Abraham. So this is talking about the Jewish people. Look at verse 17. Arise, so God tells Abraham to arise, get up, walk through the land in the length of it. So everything of north, south, east, and west that he's seeing, right? From Bethel and Ai. From that standpoint, everything that he's looking around north, south, east, and west God says, walk through the length of it and in the breadth of it, so the width. So he's looking at uh, length and width of the entire land that he's looking around him. The Bible says, for I will give it unto thee. So God says, he made a promise, I'm going to give it to you, Abram. But when he made that promise, that also meant to his seed, which we already read at verse 15 and 16. So the land grant belongs to the Jews. That's important to understand. Now, some Muslims, they might argue, or some uh, Arabs, they might argue that Abram's our father too through Ishmael. Yeah. Well, that's true that Ishmael uh, comes from Abram, and Abraham is their father too, the Arab people. Right. But what you have to understand is that God says right here at verse uh, 15 and 16, it's the promise I made to your seed, and your seed will be as the dust of the earth. And then if you read about Ishmael, what did God say? He says, this is not the promise that I give to him. It's not through Ishmael. It's going to be through Sarah, he says. So we notice right here that the land does go to the Jews. 
Now, I taught you last time, I'm not going to give a full expose and then expound every detail and give all the rationale arguments on both sides. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to make this short right here because I want to give verses uh, about the Jewish people uh, being the seed that the Lord will use forever. But uh, the short version is this, is that I know that you can go for political arguments and both sides have their uh, pros and cons. But like I told you this, is that that's the same thing with Christian churches and any other religion. You know what? You're going to find pros and cons. Why? All have sin come short of the glory of God. All right? Yes, uh, Arabs can suffer unfairness, but it's the same thing with the Jews too. And everyone, you know, can play a victim card. Everyone, trust me, if you study history, everyone has been a victim of something. Yeah. All right? Everyone has suffered unfairness. If you don't think so... Have a perfect life as much as you can. I guarantee you this, no matter how perfect your life is, that doesn't mean you won't suffer any unfairness one day. Yeah. All right, everyone suffers unfairness in life. That's tragic human history. It's called sin, all right? So when God makes a promise to an individual, don't expect the party and the individual to be perfect. See, they're going to have faults. Yeah, I understand that uh, Catholics can be better people than a lot of Baptists, you know that? Yeah. But guess what? Baptists go to heaven, and there are Catholics who go to hell. Well, that's unfair. No, it's because of what God made a promise, is that if you receive Christ, Jesus Christ for salvation, yeah. then you will go to heaven. Amen. And by the way, there are Baptists that go to hell too, believe it or not. Yeah. The point is, is it's not, uh, if you receive Jesus Christ for your salvation, you go to heaven. That's what God promised to those people. And can those particular people who receive Christ for salvation live more wickedly than Catholics and other religious people? Absolutely. You know why? Because we're all sinners. Yeah. All right? No one is free from sin. We're all sinners. Right. Well, that's very unfair. No, the point is, what did God put his promise and oath toward? All right? That's the point. In legal matters, too, if there's somebody who wrote a contract with a particular individual, it doesn't matter how immoral that person is. If the contract and oath is made with the particular party or individual, that's the promise that has to be kept toward that individual. That's why, because then God will have to be an oath breaker, a lawbreaker. What about the immoral actions of the person? Oh, don't worry, God will take care of the person. And he did that with the Jewish people for millennia, guys. Not just 2,000 years, uh, not just the Dark Ages, the Holocaust and everything. You go beyond that, even the early centuries. God knows how to take care of his children. No one gets away with sin. No one gets away with sin. That's why the poor Jewish people, they suffered for many, many years. They suffered for many, many years. So, so don't worry about the unfairness and all this kind of stuff. The point is, who did God make a promise and oath to? He has to keep it. If you want him to break it, then he can't be God then. He's a liar. Yeah. Secondly, what about the unfairness and then the political implications, the incorrections, the immoral actions involved and stuff like that? Don't worry. The Lord knows how to take care of them. Yeah. Okay, now, if we go back uh, to the text right here. So God made that promise with the land grant to the Jewish people. And then we're going to look at tons of verses, but there's just so many verses. I think it's uh, easier if I read Dr. Upman's Genesis commentary. So actually, uh, I have a list over here. So we're going to look at through a, a slew of verses. There's going to be a lots and lots of verses that we're going to be looking at about the Jewish people uh, being God's seed and God's chosen people. There's uh, teachings going around for some of you who don't know there are people that are trying to teach that uh, the Jewish people today are not the real Jews. Now, I know that's pretty hard to believe, all right, but there are people who actually teach that. So then when you talk about the Ashkenazi Jewish people and probably the Sephardic and the other Jewish people, they'll say, no, those people are not real Jews. They'll call them Khazars and etc. Now, I'm not going to expound on this, okay? I already expounded in my previous Genesis studies. But that's not true. The Jews are God's seed, chosen people. And yeah, uh, believe it or not, the hardest soul to win to salvation is not a Catholic and it's not a Muslim. It's a Jew. Jews are the most stubborn, the hardest people to reach to salvation. But guess what? Those are the people who are the chosen people of God. So they are the seed. And I know it's hard to believe and people cannot believe that. Well, how can, uh, how can God choose them? 
as his seed and his children. It just doesn't make sense. Well, no, because uh, there are too many verses on it. So we have to look at the Bible, Isaiah 66. I'll tell you how you can disprove Christianity, all right? You know how you disprove Christianity? You know how you can prove the Bible is wrong? Get rid of the Jewish people. And guess what? That will happen in the future. There will be another Holocaust genocide of Jewish people. Adolf Hitler, he's just a precursor. He's just an evidence of human history that this happened to Jews before and it can happen again in the future. So why? Because the devil wants to prove God wrong. He wants to make the world convinced that, see, these people, they're not real. You've got to realize it's mostly Jews who, made up, uh, who gave you the Bible. It's because of the Jewish people that Jesus Christ was born and Christianity was even born. The original apostles, founding fathers of Christianity, they were Jews. So the devil wants to get rid of the Jewish people. So if you can get rid of them, then you can disprove Chris, uh, Scripture. The Jewish people is the only evidence you need to become a saved believer, to be honest. It's just the Jews. It's, there's no other culture group of people. You can go back to the B.C.s and where they were able to retain their culture, their language, the scriptures. They didn't have technology, free access. And you got the Dark Ages burning up their materials. You got the Holocaust that tried to attempt to wipe out the people. They had no nation for uh, two th more than 2,000 years. They had no... Uh, country. They were wanderers because they went all the way from the Babylonian captivity, B.C.s, all the way to the 1940s. All right, enough said. Let the Bible talk for me. Isaiah 66, verse 22. The Bible says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall what? Your seed and your name remain. All right, there's another passage. I want you to turn to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. The Christians didn't exist that time. There are Christian churches that teach that we are the real Jews. You wish, no, you're not. There are people that are claiming to be Jews. Do you know that? There are... Uh, White people that are trying to claim to be Jews, they're called British Israelites. There are black people claiming to be Jews, they're called black Hebrew Israelites. And these people exist. Uh, replacement theology that uh, some Calvinists get attracted to. A lot of people who are into conspiracy theories and who uh, see the Jewish people as the elites, they get sucked into wrong doctrine that there is no pre-tribulation rapture. We will go through the tribulation. The Jews are not the real Jews me, a saved Christian, is a real Jew. No, that's baloney, all right? Now, God does call us Jews spiritually, all right, as his children, but that's a spiritual plane. But physical, literal, national people has never been eliminated. They have never been replaced. Why? Because God says, unless you get rid of the whole universe, then you can get rid of my seed. Well, you're still standing, you're still breathing. Here's the thing. You know how you can prove Jews don't exist? Unless you drop dead and all the people in this world drop dead. Then Jews don't exist. That's what God said. All right? Jeremiah chapter 33. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. You read the verse. The whole existence only exists as, as long as the Jews exist. Jeremiah 33. We'll look at verse 20. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, if he can break my covenant of the day. Wow, God's challenging. He challenged for the past 6,000 years, no one could wipe out his people. Uh, if we keep reading on, Jeremiah 33, verse 20, if he can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should be, not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, so notice right here that David's lineage and these people uh, will not continue if you can uh, break the day and the night. Amos 9. Amos 9. We're going to look at the book of Amos chapter 9. So unless you can blot out the sun and blot out the moon, then you can get rid of the children of Israel, God says. Quite a challenge the Lord's giving. Yeah. It shows right here that that book is true, just looking at the Jewish people. If you study about uh, the war that they had where a couple nations tried to uh, 
battle against the nation of Israel, you know the history that Israel won, and then that's why they were able to retain their nation today. But if you, it, I don't know if you look at the documentaries or the stories behind it, there are cases of soldiers where it was impossible, they didn't have the resources and what they need to win, but there were miracles that just kept happening, like somebody threw a grenade inside a tank and just never went off, and etc. There are just crazy accounts of that. Why? Unless there is a God. Amos 9.15. The Bible says, and I will plant them upon what? Their land. All right. It doesn't matter if you kick out the Jews again. God's going to make sure they get their land back. They didn't have it for thousands of years. Can you imagine these people laughing at God, mocking the Bible? But they got it back the 1940s. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord their God. So he promised he's going to give them that land. In fact, they're going to, verse 13 and 14, eat, drink, plant that land. They're going to build up property there. You're, you're not going to get rid of it. 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then we'll read verse 10. The Bible reads here, as 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10, when God is speaking with David, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. So God made a promise and an oath that one day the mankind won't persecute the Jews anymore, that they will live in their land in stability. So that time has not come yet, but God will do it one day. All right, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31. But you're already seeing glimpses of that already. You're seeing glimpses of that. God didn't do it yet. Why? He want, he's giving you time to get saved. He's giving you time to believe. Because when the real thing comes down, it'll be too late. There is no turning back. So God is giving you a chance. Jeremiah chapter 31, and we'll read verse 35. Jeremiah chapter 31, and then we'll read verse 35. Notice these challenges God gives. Like, the Lord's not shying away from it. He says, oh, I know my people are going to continue. They're not going to go away. They will last. The Bible says, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of, Lord of hosts is his name, if those ordinances depart from before me. So basically, if the laws of science are gone. Look, every unbeliever, atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter who you are or Christian, you can't uh, outthrow the laws of science. They believe the laws of science. Well, what did God say? Then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So if you get rid of the laws of science, then you can rid, get rid of the Jews. The Jewish people is as strong as any empirical evidence and data. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? The thousands of reports, research papers, backing up science, and etc., backing up every law of science, is as strong as the Jewish people in evidence. That's why the devil wants to wipe out the Jew. That's why the Jewish people, you got to realize it's a 1%, like less than 1% of the population. These are a small fringe of people, yet they survive, they thrive, and they're successful in business and physical prosperity. Phenomenal. What more does God have to prove to this wicked world? Uh, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 17. And then we'll read verse 8. No matter how much you think that, well, no, that land shouldn't belong to the Jews, it doesn't matter what you think, because God is God, okay? So in the end, it's going to go, matter what he thinks about it. So it doesn't matter how much you feel or think about that, because God is God, he's going to do it. No matter how much you feel, you're not going to change laws of science, the evidence and oath he puts on Scripture. 
No matter how much you cry and weep, you can't change the sun and the moon. It's the same thing. God says that uh, unless you change the sun and the moon, then you can get rid of my people. You can say this land doesn't belong to them. Look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. What did God say to Abram? And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all, did it say all? All the land of what? Canaan for an everlasting possession. See, there is no partial land divisions. God gave them the whole land. What Abram was seeing north, south, east, and west from the standpoint of Bethel and Ai. Uh, we're going to look at Psalms 105. Psalms 105. This is more than enough evidence. There's no such thing that as the Christian church replaces the Jews or that the land doesn't belong to the nation of Israel. There's just way too many scriptures and then you cannot deny it. It's just overloaded. All right, we're going to look at Psalm 105. This is a good verse at verses 8 through 11. Who is this group of people at Psalm 105? He hath remembered his covenant forever at verse 8. The word which he commanded to a what? Thousand generations. Unbreakable. Which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for a what? Everlasting covenant. Saying, what's the everlasting covenant? Unto thee will I give the what? Land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. These Jews had the guts to say that during the early B.C.s when this book was written. Before the Babylonian captivity, this book was written. They had the audacity to say that. There are so many cultures, nations, and kingdoms. The, the powerful Aztecs, uh, China's kingdom, and all these people that bragged and talked about their dynasty, their reign going on for a thousand years or longer. Hitler thought that he could bring another new thousand-year reign kingdom. But look at all of them, gone. Don't continue. New people come, new cultures come, new dynasties, new kingdoms come. But the Jews continued on. That was, so th that's what makes them different from all other mythologies, all other gods, all other stories, and accounts of people saying, well, we have a God too. We have our religion too. We have uh, our kingdom, our miracles too. They're all gone. But the Jews continued. All right, let's go back to Genesis 13. Genesis 13. We're going to go back to our main text. So God gave that promise to Abram, and no matter how much you cry or whine about it or feel about it, you can vote, you can protest, you can even do wars, you can even do genocide, you'll never wipe out the Jew. I promise you that much, all right? We're going to look at verse 18. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, so Abram, he removed his tent where he was at from Bethel and Ai. Then he went onward to where Mamre was, which is in Hebron. So the Bible says that he went down this way where it was, uh, because I'm going to try to make some space and room, I'll put here as Mamre. But it is in Hebron, it says. Now, this is very interesting. Before I give the interesting note, let's finish the verse. And built there an altar unto the Lord. So Abram built another altar to the Lord. So it shows right here, whenever he went to a place or direction, uh, he never stopped and he never forgot to thank the Lord, spend time worshiping the Lord, giving him honor. So that shows he's a good man. If you look at, this is so interesting. If you look at the map, and you can pull it up on Google if you want to and just type down Abraham, uh, map of Abraham. If you do something like that, then you'll see all these cities where Abraham went to. But Abram, during that time he was Abram. Remember, when he went toward Egypt from the land of Canaan, which direction was he going? He was going south, right? Now, the Bible is pretty plain that Ab Abram, the direction he tends to go is south. If you look back throughout the pre his previous history, his previous travels, Genesis 13.1, it says when Abram went out of Egypt, 
he went into the south, right? So he's talking about the south of Canaan. If you look back at verse chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, he did go to Bethel before, all right? But what did he do? He went, verse 9, he went still toward the south. Do you recall what I taught you that last time at this passage? I taught you that at verse 7 of Genesis 12, verse 7, God said when Abram was in that land, Bethel and Ai, God says, I'm going to give you all this land. So this is your land. But Abram, he left his land that God promised. And he went toward the south at verse 9. He went so south that he went eventually to Egypt. And I taught you last time that this was a possible scenario where Abram uh, disobeyed the Lord. He did not stay in the terrain where uh, the Lord blessed him with. He went outside of God's blessing into the world out there. When he went outside into the world, he left God's blessing. If you look back at Genesis chapter 13, though, and verse 16, 17, 18, so 17, 18. This is interesting. So Abram's back at the same scenario, right, Bethel? God says, this is all your land. But what did God say at verse 17? Walk through the land. So Abram did not have to stay there then this time. God says, you can go. Just walk toward where he mentioned, verse 14, north, south, east, and west. So what did God do? He gave Abram an opportunity to pick. He didn't say, this is your land that I'm going to bless you with. And Abram realized, okay, I have to stay here to uh, get blessed by God. That's not the same scenario at Genesis 4, uh, 13. This time God says, look around you north, south, east, and west. Go anywhere you want. That's what I'm going to give to you. And then Abram, his tendency of direction is always south, just like last time. He went south, but this time he's not in sin when he's doing that. But last time when he went south, he was sinning because he went to Egypt. Okay, what's the point right here? The point is, this is an additional thing you need to realize. Last teaching I taught you, when God blesses you with something, you got to stay there. Don't ever depart from that. We're, uh, we're too blessed, we're too rich, but people depart from that. They want to uh, they're spoiled by God's blessing, thinking there's more out there, and they want to go to the direction they want. So they go down to the direction they want, which is south, right? Your Christian life is south, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah you backslide, you know, you go down, you go downhill, you go south, man. Way south into the, man, and then your Christian life is so cold after that. They go, uh, Abram, his tendency of direction is to go south. But you got to keep, uh, you got to remain where God says, this is where I'm going to bless you. And you got to stay there. But here's another thing to realize. That doesn't mean that God is not going to give you your desires. There are times your desires conflict with God's will and he won't give it to you. But there are times that your desires might be something that the Lord can grant you. He gave Abram, verse 14, Genesis 13, 14, he says, Look at any direction you want. Now go. What did that mean? Abram can go wherever he chose. What was his direction? I want to go south again. And this time he wasn't in sin. Now look at Psalm 34. Psalm 34. You know what my point is, church? Here's my point. My point is, I preached this a few times before. I don't know if people really understood this. But you have to understand that when God gives you something in life, He wants you to stay in the blessing that He gives to you. He doesn't want you to go down the wrong path. But people, they don't trust in the Lord, and they prefer to go in a direction that they want to go to. And when they do that, when they choose a direction where they want to go to, then they're never happy, and God's not going to bless them in their life. So when God doesn't bless them in their life, that's why it's important that you surrender your desire to his desire, to his will, and trust in him. But people, they are not willing to trust in the Lord. Because they are not willing to trust in the Lord, then they're unhappy. They go south like Abram, 
to the land of Egypt. And then finally you learn your lesson and then you realize, God, I've been a fool. I'm so sorry. I should have stayed at the place where you wanted me to go. And then God's like, well, about time that you surrender to my will because I was going to grant you your desire. How many of you have experienced that? I know I've experienced that. Until I gave up my desire, then God gave me back my desire. Now, it's true that not all my desires God gives back because all my, uh, all my desires, you're going to find most of it is flesh. So God wants to get rid of the fleshly parts first yeah. so that I can enjoy my desire more genuinely this time. Does that make any sense to you? Okay. Look at uh, Psalm 34, and people don't believe in this passage. Verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Look at Psalm 37 now. Psalm 37. Can you trust the Lord with your life? Give up your desire. The greatest thing you can ever do, the greatest thing you can ever do that you will never, ever regret is to give up your desire to the Lord. Surrender it, give it up to him, go through the sacrifice, sacrifice it on the altar, and let God transform your desire into something better. Look at Psalms 37, and notice what the Bible says at verse uh, 5, verse 5. The Bible says right here, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall Bring it to pass. Look at the context of verse 4. Abram, he didn't commit his way to the Lord. He went his own way south. But when Abram committed his way to the Lord, look at verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee what? The desires of thine heart. How about that? But you got to delight yourself in the Lord first. You got to stay in where God told you he would bless you first. Until you delight yourself and find joy in that, then you'll notice that the other desires, you, old desires you gave up, it suddenly came back and God granted it to you. But that can only happen when truly your old desires are gone. When truly your old desires are surrendered to the Lord. And when you do that, the Lord gives you a new desire and you're thankful for the new desire. But then, after you're enjoying your new desire, God brings back some of the old desires you thought was gone. And then some of you might go, Oh, is this right? But God's like, no, it's right. Go north, south, east, and west. You can go south again, and I'll bless you. And then at that point, you know what happens? Then you realize, man, God is more than good to me. He's more than good than what I thought. I knew he was good, you know, but he's more than I thought that he would be. I'll tell you what, every single one of you did not scratch the surface yet. God's going to give you more than what you expect. Your life is just beginning. But uh, you have to surrender to the Lord. Until you surrender, then God can give you the desires of your heart. And what I mean by that is not that fleshly, sinful, wrong desires. I'm talking about the true desires. Desires that are still inside you, but you haven't awoken yet. You just replaced it with false desires. Desires that are illusionary. God needs to take your desires, clean it, and then give you actually what you really wanted all that time. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and open our eyes more to understand every word in that book. Help us to learn not only doctrine, but practical life applications where we can live better lives to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.